So if this is the piecewise function I have to graph and find the domain of. Let's go ahead and graph it first, then discuss its domain. If I'm going to graph this, let's take a look at the two pieces we've got. And to keep things simple and review this idea, let's just graph each piece one at a time. And then we'll worry about these little restrictions we've got over here, okay? So first piece you've got, the function defined is x. So what does y equals x look like? Well, it's a line, right? Basically goes right through the origin, doesn't it? y-intercept 0, slope's 1, so if I was, I don't know, definitive about a couple of points here, graphing y equals x, you know it goes through the origin, y-intercept is 0, as well as x-intercept, and slope is 1, so up 1 over 1. If I drew the entire line out, it would look like this. And if you miss the points, you just make the points bigger. There you go. Now we got it. So again, graphing one piece at a time, let's uh, look at the second piece now. Got y equals x plus 2. Also a line, right? This time the y-intercept is 2. So I plot a point at 2. Slope is 1. I go up 1 over 1. In this case, we've got a couple of parallel lines. A little bit better hitting the points at that time. So I've got an idea of what both of these lines look like, but I also understand with piecewise functions that I don't want the entire portions of those lines. Where we're cutting things off here is basically where x is 0, right? So for guidance, where x is 0, you could draw a little line through here. Give yourself a little understanding of how to cut these off. Uh, a little trick I used in my pre-calc classes was I drew some arrows to the outside. Arrows pointing away from that line to show me what is less than, what is greater than. And then I just matched up the symbols up here with my zeros for each piece. So where it's less than or equal to zero, that'd be this side of the line. Apparently, I only want to have this y equals x part. So this was y equals x, right? That means I do not want this portion of the other line, right? I only want the red portion here. So I take that out. And then on the other side, on the other side, we're talking about where everything is greater than, right? So I match up that symbol to right here. On the greater than side, I only want this blue piece, so to speak. So I take out the red. And now everything should match up with my original piecewise function. And remember, it is a function. So if you do a real quick vertical line test, vertical line test should pass. Now, does the vertical line test pass here? What have I forgotten to do? Yeah. Open circle on the top one. Okay, you need an open circle on the top one because the open circle on the top one would correspond to the fact that you've got x is greater than 0 and not equal to 0. So if I go in here and fudge this a little bit, take that out. Clearly mark that as open. There's a way to graph the function. Now in terms of domain, really you should know what your domain is just by looking at the restrictions that have been placed on each of the uh, pieces of the function. So if you look at your domain, one way you could express it is you could form really a union between these two ideas. But if you form a union between those two ideas, you'd have all real numbers, right? And you can see that from the graph because as you travel from left to right, which is the way the x values travel, you've got everything included for the x values over here because of the red portion. You have everything included right here at 0. And then you have everything included out here because of the blue portion. Domains all reals. And a lot of times on these piecewise functions that we play with, 
that is going to be the case. Okay, so three pieces this time. We've reviewed the concept now. We can move a little bit quicker on this one as we break up all the pieces. Give myself a few definitive marks to work with here to get started. But let's look at the first piece. For the first piece, essentially what you're graphing is y equals negative 1. What does y equals negative 1 look like? A horizontal line. Yep, horizontal line. So y equals negative 1. If I graph that entire line, it would pass through the y-axis at negative 1. In a minute here, we'll break up the pieces that we actually need. Second piece. You're graphing y equals x. So we did that on the previous problem. Got the y-intercept here. Got the slope up 1 over 1. Line passes through both points like so. And on the last piece, we're graphing y equals 1. So also a horizontal line. This time passes through the y-axis at 1. And now we got a lot going on here. So consider how you're going to break this up into pieces. We look at the restrictions we have on our domain over here. Which, by the way, you know what your domain is yet? Is it all reals on this one? Okay. It will be all reals. We got something covered for every single x value here between all three pieces. But we've got two locations that we want to focus in on where we want to cut off this graph. One of those locations is going to be where x is negative 1. And we got that in a couple of these pieces. The other is going to be where x is 1. I put some lines in here for guidance. You can put the arrows in if you like, if that helps with the less than, greater than idea. Let's see, for the uh, red portion here, the red portion is going to be where x is less than negative 1. This is my line for negative 1. Less than is going to be to the left. So with regards to the red portion, right, I want this part right here, meaning I need to take out this guy and this guy. And we noticed this happened on the, uh, the last problem. We did have an open circle in one of the locations. As we make a connection here, to where x is going to be negative 1. Are we going to include that for this piece? Are we going to include that? Since it's just less than and not equal to, as we connect here, whoops, try to keep my colors here consistent, that's going to be open, right? So we've cleaned up the first region. Second region. Second region is from negative 1 to 1. Y is going to equal X, so that's the blue portion. All right, from negative 1 to 1, we only want the blue part. If we take out the other parts from negative 1 to 1, that would be the red part down here, get it out of there. And the purple part, get that out of here. So now we only have that blue part in that middle section. Um, as far as the points are concerned, we are going to include negative 1 for that section. So we will fill this in. So it's possible it's going to be open for one but closed for the other, and it just happens to intersect. That is possible. Now when we get over here to where x is 1, and that meets that line we're cutting things off at, it's going to be open, right? But wait, there's more. There's a third piece. And with that third piece, we are now focusing our attention in on the purple portion of the line where x is greater than or equal to 1. So here's our little cutoff for 1. Greater than or equal to 1 is going to be out here. We only want the purple piece, so we take out the blue. We take out the red. And we notice it's greater than or equal to 1. So we will include this point. 
once again, happens to be a point of intersection, happens to be included for one piece and not the other. Really, we've got a nice continuous uh, function here. And you can see how the domain now is all real numbers. So if we're going to solve an inequality using a one-two chart, you've got a quadratic here. First thing you want to do is you want to make sure with the quadratic everything's on one side. You've got to compare to zero somehow. So you move the one over. Initially, as we get started with these problems, we solve them in a very similar fashion to how we would solve a normal equation. So if you're solving a normal equation, you've got the quadratic, maybe quadratic formula comes to mind. Um, factoring should come to mind as an option. So let's do this as a good factoring review because we'll have to be able to do this at various points in the year. If you're going to factor this out, you've got 3x squared is the first term, so it's got to be a 3x times an x. Got a 1 as the last term, so it has to be a 1 and a 1. Now you're just matching up signs, so let's see. Outside here needs to be negative. Inside needs to be positive if you're going to create that negative 2x to check. So there's your two factors. Now if this was an equation, the next thing you would do is you'd take each factor, you'd set it equal to 0 and solve. Um, that's not going to get us our answer exactly here because it's an inequality. However, that approach of setting each factor equal to zero does help us because it gives us something known as a critical value. So at this point, we're going to find these critical values. Critical values, again, are found by taking the factors, setting them equal to zero, and solving. So over here, x is going to be 1. Over here, you've got 3x equals negative 1. x is going to be negative 1 third. So these critical numbers set up boundaries for the various intervals we could have as answers here for our inequality. This is where now the 1, 2 chart comes in. How you set up a 1, 2 chart? You guys remember way back in Algebra 1, setting up your x, y charts, right? So you set up a chart kind of like that. You start with an x column. But in your y column, we're a little more specific here. We're specific to really the function that we're dealing with. And what I usually like to do is I like to go back to the factored form here, take that factored form and bring it over. Take all the pieces I'm playing with, plug it in over here. And then how we set up this chart? Well, we start because we know we have a wide range here of values that could work for this inequality. We start at negative infinity, kind of cover our whole domain here. We start at negative infinity, and we set up an interval that goes up to the smaller of the critical values that I found, so negative one-third. Then we pause and reflect at negative one-third. And we recall that at negative one-third, that was a critical value because these factors over here, well, everything was set equal to zero, right? So that means in this column, that negative one-third has to equal zero. And then we're going to set up another interval from negative one-third now, since that's where we left off. We're going to go up to the next of the critical values we found, which is one. Once again, pause, reflect at 1. Once again, at 1, we know that this expression over here has to be 0. And then we pick up where we left off at 1, and there's no more critical values. So trying to cover all real numbers here, we'll go out to infinity. So here's the thing about the 1, 2 chart. You set up these intervals based on your critical values. And then you narrow down the possibilities of what your answers could be as solutions for this problem. You know, maybe it's all three of them, maybe it's two of them, maybe it's one of them, maybe it's none of them. How we know? Well, what we do is we test. We pick values on these intervals. So if I pick a value on the interval from negative infinity to negative one-third, that's everything less than negative one-third. Now, I'm not going to get too crazy here. Okay, if it's less than negative one-third, I'm going to choose negative one. 
You want to be slightly more daring? Go out to negative 10, negative 100, whatever. Try them all. The idea is we're plugging that negative 1 into this expression, and we're looking to see what kind of result we get. Now, if I take negative 1 and I plug in to these two expressions, now let's see, negative 1 in the first expression, that's going to be negative 3 plus 1, right? So that's negative 2. That's going to be a negative value times negative 1 over here. Well, that's going to be negative 2, another negative value, which would give me a positive value, right? So what do I care about? I care about the fact that's positive. And it should be positive for any value I choose over here. You go to the next interval, you select a value between negative 1 third and 1, so say 0. Oh, it looks like a flower. Um, you take 0, you plug in. 0 goes into the first expression. Basically, you got 0 plus 1, so 1, that'd be positive. 0 goes into the next expression, you got 0 minus 1, so that'd be negative. Positive times a negative is negative. Now, on these charts with quadratics, or really any polynomial function you're dealing with, these should rotate. So choose a value down here, choose 2, 100, a million, whatever, something greater than 1. Plug it in, what you should get back is something positive that these are going to rotate through. Now what do we actually want as an answer? We want stuff that is greater than or equal to 0, which is why we compared this to 0 in the first place. Stuff that's greater than or equal to 0, we're talking positive stuff, right? So the positive results that I got over here, right here, and here, that makes up my solution. So my solution for what x could be, throw it in a little box over here to summarize. My solution for what x could be, well, x could be any value on the interval negative infinity to negative 1 third. Can't include negative infinity, but here's the question. Should I include negative 1 third? Yes, because it's greater than or equal to. And we'll form a union with the other interval that gave us positive stuff back, which would be 1 to infinity. So on that one, we'll also include it since it's greater than or equal to. There's your solution. 